we saw in the last lecture that holomorphic functions can be identified with complex analytic functions. Basically, given the point z0 in the domain of definition omega of f, we have small disks such that its closure is contained in omega and where the function f can be written down as a power series. The power series converges in this disk to our given function f. We already saw as a consequence of this that if f is holomorphic, so is f prime and that if f is holomorphic, and it turns out that f is infinitely differentiable. All these are consequences which we immediately drew from this uh, uh, theorem. We will now look at one more cor corollary to uh, this theorem. It is called the factor theorem for analytic functions. Analytic functions or rather complex analytic functions and holomorphic functions are the same. Now, I will start using them interchangeably and uh, yeah, there is no necessary distinction to be made between these two. Okay, let f be, so let omega be uh, open subset of the complex plane and f from omega to c be a complex analytic function, be a holomorphic function or a complex analytic function. Let me use the term complex analytic a couple of times so that we get used to it such that f of z0 is equal to 0, it vanishes at a point z0 in omega. Then there exists a unique uh, analytic complex analytic function. So, I will slowly stop writing complex analytic and just write analytic functions like I wrote here. There is a unique analytic function g from omega to c such that f of z is equal to z minus z0 times g of z just like how we can do for polynomials, we can do something similar for holomorphic functions as well. And it is actually factoring out the linear term z minus z0. Let us give a proof of this. The proof is going to use the uh, theorem which helped us identify complex analytic functions and holomorphic functions. Okay, the first thing to note is that away from z0, we do not have much work to do for uh, uh, on e omega minus the point z0, 1 by z minus z0 is a holomorphic function is holomorphic and clearly and defining g of uh, z to be equal to f of z by z minus z0 is holomorphic on omega minus z0 and by very definition this g satisfies the required conditions. But the problem starts arising when we start focusing at the point z0 that is where uh, we do not have 1 by z minus z0 difference. And in fact, we are looking at 1 by z minus z0 times f of z, but we still will be able to redeem ourselves by using the fact that in a neighborhood of z0, f has a power series expansion. Let me write that down since f is complex analytic. What did we prove earlier? We proved that if r is such that dz0r closure is contained in omega, then f of z has a power series expansion in dz0r. So, let us do uh, some, let us consider one such power series expansion, of course, the power series expansion, it is going to be unique uh, and write down the terms of the power series in dz0r, which is contained where dz0r is con bar is contained in omega, we have the following power series expansion. f of 
f of z is equal to summation a n z minus z 0 to the power n where n goes from let me be careful it is not going to be from 0 to infinity here it is going to be from 1 to infinity because f of z 0 which is a 0 is equal to 0. So, in particular we will be able to write this as z so for z in d z 0 r in the disk of uh, convergence of this power series if you look at define g of z to be equal to summation a n plus 1 z minus z 0 to the power n where n goes from 0 to infinity and it is a good check for you to sit down and work out that g converges in d z 0 r as well it has the same radius of convergence as the power series summation a n z minus z 0 to the power n and on d z 0 r we have z minus z 0 times g of z is equal to summation a n plus 1 into z minus z 0 to the power n times z minus z 0 which is equal to summation a n z minus z 0 to the power n where n is going from 1 to infinity which is equal to f of z. This is in particular satisfied at the point z naught as well because f of z naught is equal to 0 and the left hand side is uh, e equal to 0 as well. So, what do we have? Hence, on d z 0 r we have f of z is equal to z minus z 0 times g of z. Now, interestingly we already have uh, defined g of z in the intersection d z 0 r minus z 0 intersected with omega. We know that this is equal to f of z by z minus z 0 and one can sit down and check that on d z 0 r minus the point z 0 g of z coincides with f of z by z minus z 0 by considering the fact that that is the disk of uh, convergence of f. That g is complex analytic follows from the fact that uh, f is f by z minus z 0 is holomorphic on omega minus z naught and therefore is complex analytic and at z 0 we have given an explicit expression for uh, g in a neighborhood of z naught. So, it is co it's complex analytic at uh, every point in, in omega and further uniqueness of g. So, let me just note that down g is complex analytic at every point in omega minus z naught since f by z minus z naught is complex analytic g has a power series expansion around z naught by definition we are done the uh, uniqueness of the function g follows by the fact that g is continuous at the point z naught. The other places anyway f by z minus z naught makes sense uniqueness follows by continuity of summation a n plus 1 z minus z 0 to the power n at z naught. And with that we have a factorization of f of z into z minus z 0 times g of z. Let us prove one more consequence. This consequence is classically called as the principle of analytic continuation.
it says that if uh, we have two holomorphic functions which agree on an open subset or a disk contained in uh, the domain omega where both these functions are defined, then both f and g should be equal on omega necessarily. Let me write that down. This is called the principle of analytic continuation. Let omega be some open connected subset of C. We were, not uh, we were not imposing this condition of connectedness in the previous uh, corollary till now, but right now let us put this condition as well. Omega be an open connected subset of C and consider f and g two functions and f comma g from omega to C be complex analytic or holomorphic on omega. Suppose f and g agree on a non-empty open subset of omega. On a non-empty open subset. Then f is identically equal to g on omega. The principle of analytic continuation tells us something very substantial. So, for example, if omega was the entire complex plane, that means that f and g would be entire functions. Now, if f and g agree on a small neighborhood of 0, let us look at say a disk of radius half around 0 and suppose f and g agree on a disk of radius half around 0, that forces f to be equal to g on the entire complex plane. Some notion, some sense of rigidity always is associated by the uh, imposition of holomorphicity on f. Let us give a proof of this statement. The key fact is to use the connectedness of our domain omega. The fact that omega is open connected is going to be used crucially. And how do we do that? Define the set E to be the set of all those points z in omega such that the derivatives at the point z and the derivatives of the sorry derivatives of f at the point z coincides with the uh, derivatives of the function g at the point z. So, this is the set of all z such that f n of z is equal to g n of z for all n in natural numbers. So, if you notice the hypothesis tells us that f and g agree on a non-empty open set and therefore the set E is non-empty. E is non-empty since f and g agree on an open set, open subset of omega. The non-emptiness is covered. The first claim is that we shall prove that E is closed. That is again easy because if you look at E n, E n be the set of all those points in omega such that f n of z is equal to g n of z for a fixed n. Now we have already proved that if f is holomorphic, then f prime is holomorphic in particular it is continuously differentiable, in, in particular it is smooth. And therefore, the nth derivative of f is a continuous function. Similarly, the nth derivative of g is also a continuous function and therefore, the set En where fn and gn are equal, that set is going to be a closed set. Since fn and gn are continuous, En is a closed set. It is just the pullback of 0 under f n minus g n. And further we have E is equal to the intersection of E n which is an arbitrary intersection of closed sets which is closed. Therefore, E is closed follows very 
easily. The only thing to check is that we shall see that E is open. And to do that, let Z0 be some point uh, in E. That implies that Fn at Z0 is equal to Gn at Z0. This would imply that in the power series expansion of F around Z0, the nth coefficient which is captured by Fn by n factorial, that is the same as Gn by n factorial which is the nth coefficient of the power series expansion of G around Z0. So, this implies that F and G have the same power series expansion. This is for all n in natural numbers, that is what it, that is what forces the power series expansion to coincide in d z 0 r, where d z 0 r bar is contained in omega. The moment we have that, this implies that f n of w is equal to g n of w for all n in natural numbers and d z 0 r is contained in E, which implies that E is open as well. And by connectedness, this will be a separation if E is not the entire set. Since omega is connected and E is non-empty, we have E is equal to omega. And that is precisely what we had set out to prove. What is that if E is equal to omega that would mean that F is equal to G on the entire set omega. Let us look at a slightly stronger version of this statement. We can actually prove that uh, the 0 set of a holomorphic function will always be isolated. In some sense, we are proving a stronger version of what we have just proved. We are just proving that the set of points at which f and g, two functions defined on omega, the set of points where f and g agree, that should not have a limit point. That is what we will be proving. It is not just uh, on an open set that we need. The moment f and g agree on a set which has a limit point, we will be able to show that f is identically equal to g. This theorem is also sometimes called as the identity theorem. So, non-trivial holomorphic functions have isolated zeros. Let me write it down and uh, uh, then we will see what the exact statement is. Let omega be an open connected subset of C. And F from omega to C be a holomorphic function or a complex analytic function if you prefer it that way now. Which, so let me add a non-trivial holomorphic analytic function. Okay, which is not identically equal to 0 that means there is at least one point where our function f is not 0 and such that f of z0 is equal to 0 then there exists epsilon positive such that f of z is not equal to 0 on d z 0 epsilon minus z 0. So, at any point in the disk, in the punctured disk uh, of radius epsilon around z naught, f will not vanish. That is what it means to say that the zeros are isolated. The moment we have a 0, we will have a disk such that in disk around the 0, such that in the punctured disk f does not vanish at all. Let us give a proof of this statement. The first observation is that uh, at the point z naught, all derivatives will not vanish. So, that is the first observation. Since 
uh, f is not identically equal to 0 let me put it this way if f n of z naught is equal to 0 for all n in natural numbers that would just mean that the power series expansion of f in a neighborhood of z naught will all have will have all coefficients equal to 0 and therefore in that neighborhood it would be equal to the 0 function but by the principle of analytic continuation then f n then f should be identically equal to 0 on the entire complex plane sorry in the entire domain omega open connected set omega but we have already assumed that f is not identically equal to 0 and therefore this cannot happen. So, let me just note that if f n of z naught is equal to 0 for all n this would imply that f is identically equal to 0 on omega by using the principle of analytic continuation which is a contradiction. Hence, there exists n or maybe n naught such that f n naught of z naught is not equal to 0 or maybe uh, we can pick n naught to be the smallest such n. So, let me just reword it. Since f is not identically equal to 0, there exists some n. Let n naught be the smallest positive integer such that f n naught of z naught is not equal to 0. Notice that n naught is greater than or equal to 1 because when n naught when if you look at f 0 of 0 that is just f of 0 and we know that that is equal to 0. So, n naught should certainly be greater than or equal to 1. Since for every k less than n naught f k of z naught is equal to 0, we can apply the factor theorem which we proved in the initial uh, part of this lecture repeatedly iteratively to conclude that we can write f as z minus z 0 to the power n naught times g of z. Let me just write that down. Since f k of z naught is equal to 0 for all k less than uh, n naught by applying the factor theorem, the factorization theorem rather of analytic functions. What is that f is holomorphic in particular it is complex analytic. We have f of z is equal to z minus z0 to the power n naught times some function g of z. Now, the key thing is to apply factorization theorem to f of z, write it as z minus z0 times g0. Now, you look at the derivative, derivative will tell us that g0 of z0 is also equal to 0 if, if uh, n naught is greater than 1. And then write g0 of z as z minus z0 times g1 of z and therefore we will be able to write f as z minus z0 to the power 2 times uh, f uh, g, g1 of z. This is being done iteratively, iteratively we have g of z in this manner. But then if g of z naught were equal to 0 that would imply that f n naught of z naught is also equal to 0. But we have assumed that n naught is the smallest integer where this does not happen where f n of uh, this is a contradiction where f n of n naught of z naught is not equal to 0 that is something which we have assumed. And therefore, this implies that g of z naught is not equal to 0. But g is again going to be a uh, power series and therefore, it is uh, holomorphic and because of that we will be able to conclude by the continuity of g by continuity of g there exists some epsilon positive such that g of z is not equal to 0 on dz0 epsilon. Notice that z minus also z minus z0 to the power n does not vanish on d of z0 epsilon minus z0. The only 0 of z0, z minus z0 to the power n is the point z0. So, on d z0 epsilon minus z0, this does not vanish. Hence, z minus z0 
to the power n into g of z does not vanish on dz0 epsilon minus the point z0. This implies that f of z does not vanish on dz0 epsilon minus the point z0. Notice that this is a very powerful result in the sense that we do not now demand that f and g are coinciding in an open set. We just need to show that if f and g coincide on a set which has a limit point, then f minus g will be vanishing at a set which has a limit point and at the point where the at the limit point the 0 is not going to be isolated which would contradict our uh, theorem which we have just proven and hence f should be identically equal to g. So, this is slightly stronger than the principle of analytic continuation. Some of its consequences are remarkable. So, for example, consider the function f of x equal to sin square rather f of z equal to sin square z plus cos square z. If we know that sin z and cos z extend the sin function and cos function which are defined on the real line, we know that uh, sin square x plus cos square x is equal to 1 on r. Now, r is certainly one set which is uh, having limit points. In, in other words, this forces sin square z plus cos square z to be equal to 1. So, we do not even have to worry looking at the power series expansion to conclude this particular identity about sin and cosine. Of course, we have already done this by uh, looking at the explicit power series expansion in the initial stages of this course, but this is one observation using the identity theorem or the fact that non-trivial analytic functions have isolated zeros. So, we will see that this theorem has some really beautiful applications when we look at some of the problems at the end of the week's lectures. Let us move ahead and uh, prove a higher order version of the Cauchy integral formula which we have proved in the last lecture. So, this is called the higher order Cauchy integral formula. We have already seen that a uh, holomorphic function is complex analytic and not only did we conclude that it is complex analytic, we also concluded what the, uh, the, the coefficients of the power series expansion at any point z0 is going to be. So, let me note that down and uh, use it to conclude what the der nth derivative at the point z0 will be. Let uh, f from omega to c be holomorphic or complex analytic. on an open set omega in C and z0 be a point in omega with d z0 r bar contained in omega. Let gamma be a curve just like in the Cauchy integral formula. Let gamma be a curve in omega minus z0 homotopic has closed curves. So, this is a closed curve by the way. Otherwise, we cannot talk about homotopic as closed curves. Homotopic as closed curves to uh, reparameterization of of gamma 1 where gamma 1 of t is equal to z0 plus r e to the power i t where t belongs to 0 to 2 pi. So, this is going to be where in omega minus z0, oh, I have already written that in omega minus z0 has already been captured here. So, in omega minus z0 we have gamma is homotopic to the circle of radius r around z0. Then f n at z0 is going to be equal to n factorial by 2 pi i times the integral f of z by z minus z naught to the power n plus 1 dz. The proof is actually already taken care of 
let me just note down the steps involved since uh, f is complex analytic at z naught and uh, the coefficient a n in the power series of f in the power series expansion of f is given by this is given by a n is equal to 1 by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma 1 oh this is over gamma by the way we will come to it this one is integral over gamma 1 uh, f of z by z minus z 0 to the power n plus 1 dz. Now, since gamma is homotopic in omega minus z naught to uh, gamma 1, this is also in particular equal to n factorial by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma 1 of f of z by z minus z 0 to the power n plus 1 dz. By Cauchy's theorem, we do have that. Since a n's are the coefficients appearing in the power series expansion of f, we no, from our uh, knowledge of power series which we developed in weeks 2 and 3 that the coefficients a n can be written in terms of the nth derivative of f at the point z naught. We know that a n is equal to f n at z naught by n factorial and by plugging it in we have f n at z naught is equal to n factorial by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma 1 which is the same as the integral over gamma of f of z by z minus z naught to the power n plus 1 dz and this is what we had set out to prove. So, if you notice when n is equal to 0 we just end up with our usual Cauchy integral formula that is why this is also called as the higher order Cauchy integral formula. And as a consequence, we directly have the Cauchy estimates using the higher order Cauchy integral formula. We will also be able to place bounds on the the derivatives of uh, f uh, in omega. Let's see what the exact statement is. Let omega be an open subset. Of C and F from omega to C be holomorphic. Suppose Z0 is some point in omega such that the disk of say radius r bar is contained in omega for some r positive. Let gamma of t be equal to z0 plus r e to the power i t for t in 0 to 2 pi. Basically, it is the circle of radius small r around z0. Suppose the absolute value of f of z is less than or equal to m for all z in gamma, in the image of gamma rather, in gamma of 0 to 2 pi then for all n in natural numbers we will be able to put a bound on how the derivatives of f at z naught will, will behave like this is going to be less than or equal to m into n factorial by r to the power n. The proof is going to be quite straightforward we just use the higher order Cauchy integral formula. So, let me just write that down by Cauchy integral formula f n at the point z naught this is going to be equal to 1 by 2 pi i times the integral over gamma of f of z by z minus z naught. So, there is an n factorial here which I missed z minus z naught to the power n plus 1 dz. 
and by looking at the absolute value here, this is going to be the absolute value here, which is going to be n factorial by 2 pi times, which is less than or equal to the absolute value of this number minus the absolute value of the integral, which is bounded by m by r to the power n plus 1. That is precisely the bound of this quantity times the arc length of gamma, which is 2 pi r. So, by cancellations, we end up with which is equal to m into n factorial by r to the power n. So, we will see a few examples of uh, how Cauchy's estimates can be used to conclude substantial conclusions on holomorphic functions in the problem session. Let me stop here.